In control process classes, one of the first things you'll learn about are first order dynamics. And the first thing to talk about is what is a first order dynamic system. And so the way we identify these kinds of systems is by analyzing the transfer functions. And transfer functions are commonly denoted G of S. And the way we figure out if we have indeed a first order uh, system is by analyzing the degree of the denominator minus the degree of the numerator. And so if this equals one, then we indeed have a first order process and we can continue in our analysis. And so to give an example of this, if g of s was equal to one over uh, some constant tau, or we'll call this k over tau s plus one, we'll note how the degree of the denominator in this case is equal to one, and uh, the degree of the uh, numerator is equal to zero. So we have a first order system. We can also have first order systems, they'll be referred to as relative first order systems in the case when we have um, some kind of transfer function that looks like a s uh, minus one over b s squared plus c s plus one. And this would be a relative first order system, but it is more complicated because now we are dealing with uh, zeros, which are roots of our numerator. And zeros will affect our behavior. And uh, just to kind of allude to it, zeros will cause our output to change direction. So the number of zeros that we have in our function the num um, will be equivalent to the number of times that our output changes uh, whatever direction it's trending to. So if we have one zero, we'll recognize inverse response behavior initially before reaching a new steady state value. And so to continue our analysis of a first order system, uh, the next thing to note will be the definition of uh, our transfer function g of s is equivalent to y of s, our output, divided by our input u of s. And so if we solve for y of s, we get g of s times u of s. And if we stick to this example here, it will be equivalent to our gain k divided by tau s plus 1 times whatever u of s is. And so if we're dealing with a step input, which is a very common uh, input we use in process control, u of s will be equivalent to the magnitude of the step input, m, divided by s. And this is in the frequency domain. And so plugging this value in, we would have m over s. And so uh, now that we have derived what y of s is in the frequency domain, we can now figure out what it will be in the time domain to figure out what kind of behavior our first order system will exhibit in the time domain. And so the way we do that is via a technique referred to as partial fraction expansion so that we can perform inverse Laplace transforms. And so uh, we'll note how we can uh, set Sorry, we can perform the heavy side technique because we have no repeated roots in y of s, like so. So we'd have uh, k over tau s plus one times one uh, m over s, and we'll set this to be some constant a one over tau s plus one plus some other fraction a two over s. And the way heavy side works is step one. We multiply all by one of the terms in your denominator, tau s plus one, and then we let s be the root uh, of that term. So let s equal minus one over tau. And when we do that, uh, what we would have is k m over minus one over tau, which would be equivalent to minus k m tau, will be equal to 
a1 plus a2 times 0. So you'll note how a2 cancels out, and we have just evaluated what a1 is. And we do the same for the other uh, term in our numerator. So multiply all by s, and then we let s equal 0. And when we do that, we will find that km will be equivalent to a2. And so we now have redefined our y of s function algebraically in terms of individual fractions that are much easier to take inverse Laplace transforms of, like so. So we would have uh, km times 1 over s minus km tau times 1 over tau s plus 1. And so continuing and taking the inverse Laplace transforms, uh, I'd like to focus on this second term initially because it is a little bit tricky. When I take the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over tau s plus 1, uh, what we can note is that it will be equivalent to, if we divide all terms on the inside by tau, uh, 1 over tau divided by s plus 1 over tau. And if we recall, um, we can pull constants out of Laplace transforms because they are linear operators, as well as the definition of, I'm sorry, this is an inverse Laplace transform, um, the Laplace transform of uh, 1 over s minus a is equivalent to uh, exponent a t, we will see that in this case, uh, a is equivalent to minus 1 over tau. Therefore, the inverse Laplace transform of this term is equivalent to 1 over tau, which was pulled out on top, times exponent minus t over tau. And when we plug this term back into here, we will recognize that we have minus km tau over tau times the exponent minus t over tau. And uh, the taus will cancel out. And we will be left with, if we also solve for this term, so taking, sorry for this being a little unorganized, but um, if we take the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s, as we'll recall, the definition of uh, Laplace transform of a constant such as a is equivalent to a over s. This tells us that this term is simply equal to 1. That means that y of t is equal to km minus km times exponent minus t over tau. And then if we algebraically simplify this slightly, we would have km times 1 minus exponent minus t over tau. And so the key takeaway to get from our time domain function that we have just derived is that at time t equals 0, so y of t equals 0 is equivalent to 0. And y uh, is a deviation variable. So what this tells us is that when we apply a step change to a first order system, there is no instantaneous initial response. The other thing to note, though, is that the derivative of y, the slope of y, the change in the output um, over time, is at a maximum at t equals 0. So I can let you guys evaluate that by taking the derivative and setting t equal to 0. We will recognize um, and we would take the second uh, derivative to recognize the ma local maxima of our first derivative. Um, so what we find from our time domain function is that a generic uh, first order dynamic system with a step input will have a graph that resembles something like this. And it will approach some new steady state value. And uh, the other important things to consider are the residence times that are going on here. So we would have um, at one residence time and then at 
five residence times, and tau is referring to the same tau that is uh, in our initial or our original transfer function. Uh, we are getting closer and closer to realizing our new steady state value, and so you are approximately 63 percent of the way to your new steady state value after one tau, and this is a uh, law of the math. Um, and then we are approximately 99% of the way towards reaching a new steady state value after five tau have elapsed uh, since our step input of magnitude m was applied to our system. And this is uh, before we get to uh, our new steady state value. Another thing I would like to make note of is looking at the gain of our system, k. So if we have a step input, something in the term uh, u of s is equivalent to some uh, magnitude m over s. In this case, our gain is defined to be the change in your output divided by the change in your input u. And this will have units of your output over your input. So gain does not only refer to your output is the key takeaway from this. It's a very common mistake. I make it quite often. <laughs> so um, recognizing that the gain of your system uh, takes into account both the output and the input is a big takeaway. Another thing is tau, sorry, tau uh, indicates the time response of your system. And so what I mean by that is if tau is a big value, uh, we'll have a slow response. Slow response. And then if tau is very small, uh, we'll have a faster response. And this should make intuitive sense. If we had a large residence time, it could indicate that we have a very large reactor volume, for instance. And so a step change in some input would take a very long time or a longer time to realize a change in one of your state variables relative to if we had a very small reactor volume uh, that uh, in which we would reckon or realize a very quick response time to some input change. And then uh, another thing I would like to make a note of uh, is in our transfer functions, g of s, we'll note how we have uh, in our numerator some term, in this case it was k, and then in our denominator we had tau s plus 1. And this is a physical system because the root, which is the, I'm sorry, the pole, or the poles, which are the roots of the denominator, are all less than zero. And so if we had a transfer function in which one of our poles was a positive value, Uh, this indicates a physicality. Uh, in other words, the system doesn't exist or it has some kind of integrating behavior that is physically impossible. And then another thing, the zeros, in this case we have none, but if we had a transfer function that had uh, zeros in the numerator, we um, will dictate the behavior of your graph. And so to summarize, poles will represent physicality or aphysicality of your system, and zeros will dictate how your graph behaves as it reaches the new steady state value. So if you have uh, one pole, for instance it, it instance, it indicates that your graph will change directions on its way to realizing the new steady state value. So this summarizes uh, a, a a, an introduction to first order dynamic systems and how we're able to derive the time domain functions that uh, uh, resemble them, uh, represent them. And uh, the key takeaway, if you're looking to just simply identify them, is to look at the initial behavior of your graph, y of t over time, and 
What you'll note is that y of t is equal to zero at time equals zero, but it also has a maximum slope at t equals zero. And uh, yeah, so I hope you guys find this useful. Let me know if you have any questions and thanks for watching.